Muy buenas días, tardes a todos ustedes. Eh, es un placer ver el auditorio lleno y obviamente eh, el personaje que nos acompaña hoy pues, lo merece, tener este auditorio lleno de jóvenes que seguramente quieren saber mucho de inmunología. Eh, agradezco mucho eh, que el doctor Martin Rolf Sinkernagel haya aceptado estar con nosotros. I really appreciate uh, Martin your presence here. It's a real honor that you are with us in the School of Chemistry. Particularmente en este año en que se celebran los, el primer centenario de nuestra facultad. Y este primer centenario hay que celebrarlo como se merece, con las mejores visitas académicas que podamos tener, con la mejor vida académica que podamos lograr y sobre todo con la participación de todos ustedes en eventos de esa naturaleza. Eh, déjeme por favor leer brevemente una semblanza del doctor Sinkernagel. Ustedes tienen en el folleto que les han dado a la entrada esto que voy a decir, entonces simplemente para resaltar eh, la vida académica de nuestro invitado. Eh, y para que vean cómo es que se llega a, un, a ser premio Nobel, por si a alguno de ustedes se les ocurre que quiere ser. Están todos perfectamente del tiempo de serlo. So, sorry, uh, Martin, uh, uh, it's just an introduction, nothing wrong to be said about you. <risa> El doctor Sinkernagel, suizo, médico suizo, nace en Basilea en 44, estudia medicina, en su ciudad natal, termina la carrera, estudia, toma un curso de medicina tropical y otro de medicina experimental ahora en Zurich y trabaja primero como médico en hospitales en diferentes lugares de su país. Y en ese tiempo en que, que de, quiere decidir qué es, y esto lo puede, no dice allí, pero yo se los digo porque ya le leí, eh, no sabe qué, qué va a hacer de su vida y empieza a buscar que si la, la medicina, que si ser cirujano, y no, no le gustó ser cirujano, y se va a la investigación. No sabe exactamente cuál, pero empieza a entrar en el sistema inmune, en la inmunología, y a través de contactos eh, se va a Australia a hacer investigación en inmunología, y se conoce a Peter Doherty, y con quien empieza a hacer estudios de investigación en la Escuela de Investigación Médica John Curtin en Canberra, en Australia. Trabajos que se refieren a la capacidad de defensa del sistema inmunitario. Tras sus investigaciones en Australia, dos años con Doherty en Australia, ese trabajo es pionero y es una de las razones por las cuales recibe el premio Nobel, el trabajo que hace en Australia, porque a Doherty también le dan el premio Nobel. Entonces, vean, no sabía qué hacer, se va a Australia, trabaja dos años y todo cambia. Finalmente termina su estancia en Australia, eventualmente se va a Estados Unidos, está en la clínica Scripps de La Joya y quiere él trabajar en Suiza, pero no le dan chamba porque hay pocas plazas nuevas para investigadores en Suiza y entonces nadie le hace caso. Eventualmente un profesor se jubila y él es invitado a tomar esa plaza, pero de que le invitan a tomar la plaza, a que le dan la plaza, pasan dos años y él, él sigue trabajando en la joya. Bueno, ese trabajo pionero en Australia y el que hace posteriormente tanto en, tan en Scripps como regresando a, a Zurich, es lo que le dan el Premio Nobel de Medicina en 96, junto con Peter Doherty. Eh, los trabajos son sobre la forma en que el sistema inmunológico distingue las células infectadas de la sana, eh, el trabajo de Doherty y de Sinkernagel eh, ha permitido hacer avances muy importantes en las investigaciones sobre el SIDA, dice su documento, ya que han podido demostrar que la infección de un virus puede, durante la defensa del sistema inmunológico, seleccionar las mutaciones en el virus que no son reconocidas por el cuerpo humano. Y dice el profesor Sinkernagel, en ese juego diabólico entre el virus y las células humanas, lo que contribuye a la cronicidad de la enfermedad, todo mundo se defiende de todo mundo. Los virus de las células y las células de los virus. 
y esto es lo que hace la carrera de la vida en todos los sistemas biológicos. Por, por eso he recibido infinidad de premios y reconocimientos del profesor Siegfried el Ernst Young, el premio Ernst Young, el premio Mac Forster, el premio de la Fundación Gertner, el Albert Lisker Medical Research Award, y es miembro de la Royal Society, independientemente de ser eh, emérito y honorario, profesor honorario de muchas universidades en, Australia, en Suiza y fuera de Suiza. Y aparte fue el tutor de un profesor distinguido, el doctor Constantino López Macías, quien realmente es el que logró este gran hecho de traer a un premio Nobel y yo le agradezco muy profundamente a Constantino el que haya hecho este esfuerzo y que comparta con la Facultad de Química de la UNAM la presencia del doctor Martin Rolf Sinkernagel. And please, Martin, uh, please, I ask you to come here and give us uh, your conference. Thanks a lot for being with us. very much for your very kind introduction and what I'll try to do today is talk about specificity because in immunology you know specificity determines everything else and it's surprising how little we understand about specificity so I will give you a very general introduction about immunity and immunology. I will go through some basic parameters and then sort of zero in on B cell or antibody specificity and also have a look at some aspects of T cell specificity. Now, what are the, the major problems I think there are the, the biggest problems. We are too many human. <laughs> That's the biggest problem. And that is directly linked to infectious diseases. Because vaccinations have changed survival in humans. It has changed dramatically. Just remember, in Roman times, 200 years, 2,000 years ago, the life average life expectancy was 18 years. 300 years ago, it was 29 years. There were always a few old people, like myself. <laughs> However, most of the kids and young adults died between zero and 10 years of age. And of course, in evolution, that's the key period, because after you have generated your next generation of kids, you know, you can't be part of evolution anymore. So infectious diseases are really the m most nefarious and most effective pressures on our survival. And it's true for all, all, all uh, uh, vertebrates. So we actually need only for about 20 to 25 years to fulfill basically the requirements for caring for the next generation. Just remember, I mean, 300 years ago, girls had their first kids between 14 and 16. Not like nowadays at 39, <laughs> <laughs> which in a way is crazy. But that's I think the biggest problem besides to the humans is that we all behave rather stupidly. <laughs> and education, part of it, the task of the university, of course, is simply to overcome that problem. But you all know it never works, you know.
Does now everybody understand me? <laughs> Terrific. Okay, so, so that's, you know, that's a huge problem. But in a way, we are still animals. So that explains it, you know. And then, of course, because of genetic diversity, we are not all equal. Some people don't like that, but that's just how it is. So let's go into some very general remarks on how the immune system works. And it's actually very simple. If you have an infection, I just depict here the infection by a virus. There are basically two outcomes. Because there are viruses that destroy, destroy the host cell in which they replicate. Poliovirus, rabies virus, measles virus, smallpox and so on belong to that. And you immediately recognize those are the viruses that kill you in 7 to 10 days. And they are all childhood infections. But you could make the same argument for bacteria, for classical parasites, because all these rules are very generalizable. So in this case, where the virus destroys the host cell, there's only one way. Your resistance mechanisms must be very efficient and very prompt. And the reason for that is because once the virus replicates locally at the site of infection, it starts to spread via blood, and then, of course, the virus or the toxin or the bacterium or the parasite reaches the brain, and since we only have one brain, that's the end of it. Huh? And that happens within three to five days. So the response has to be very prompt, and the response against these types of viruses is always antibodies is the key. You don't need cell-mediated immunity. You only need T cells to switch an IgM response, the early response, to an IgG. And the difference between IgM and an IgG is IgM has a half-life of about 12 hours. IgG has a half-life of 20 days. So the efficacy is much prolonged. I'll come back to that. The second type of infections are those, and there are many more, these non-cytopathic infections, because the, the aim of a virus is not to kill the host, because if, if the virus is efficient in killing all hosts, the, yeah, the virus is gone. So these viruses are actually a majority. And in this case, where there is no damage by the virus infection, of course, you don't need immune protection. In fact, if the virus doesn't kill the cell, it's usually the immune response, particularly of the cellular type, that destroys the infected cell, and that causes a problem. And we call that, in general terms, immunopathology. You know, when the immune response is not protective, but damaging. Hepatitis B, HIV, hepatitis C, many, many virus infections are actually causing clinical problems of this type. So, you know, these are rather diametric, diametrically distinct demands on the system. This is obligatory, and this is actually obligatory not to happen. So, these viruses jump from an infected individual to the next at a particular time. Namely, then when the immune response doesn't exist. And this is before or at birth. The immune system starts with nothing up till birth. And from then it matures and takes about in humans 6 to 12 months to be fully functional. So in that early period, there is no immune response. And therefore, these viruses can be handed down from the mother through the placenta or through the blood that is transfused at birth to the next offspring. Fantastic coevolution, isn't it? If the infection happens later, then these infections have the problem of immunopathology. And HIV is such a case. 
You know, HIV, it's not the virus that kills the cell. It is actually the immune response against the infected cell that kills immune cells in that particular case, not liver cells as in the case of uh, hepatitis. Now here, I just want to make an additional very important point. All infectious agents have one thing in common, that they usually have a multimeric identical determinant at the outside, on the envelope. And this multimeric identical determinant really triggers the immune response enormously, fantastically, efficiently. And I'll talk about that particular problem. Now, for T cells, you know, T cells recognize whether a, a target cell is infected or not infected. They wouldn't touch on infected cells. They would destroy the CD8 T cells. They would kill these um, virus-infected cells. And as I've said, it is this activity that then causes this immunopathology. Second general point is that an infection never starts everywhere. An infection always starts locally, in the skin or in the mucosa, but never generalized. Because if that were the case, then we have just seen that toxin or the virus is spread all over and would reach the brain or the liver and kill us very efficiently. That's why the, the virus, for example, pox, smallpox would be a classical example, or measles, infects locally, it takes one to two days for the virus to be reproduced, then it gets transported through the draining lymph node, there it replicates again, takes two, th three days. So, you know, the initiation of an infection is, is, is not like an explosion, it's actually protracted. And that leaves the first station of the immune system some time to actually trigger the T cells, trigger the B cells. These get multiplied by every six to eight hours. So there's a rapid expansion of, of the specific B cells and T cells. And then the virus or the bacteria spreads systemically, but at that time, antibodies are there, particularly of the IgM type. Now, a general point I also want to make is if a virus happens to be selected to infect a cell that is outside of the reach of the immune system, like skin epithelial cells for warts papillomaviruses, such an infection is simply not noticed by the immune system because the antigen never reaches, at least initially, the draining lymph node. So such an infection doesn't exist, and that's why benign tumors called by papillomavirus initially can, you know, last for months in certain kids. So that gives you a certain idea about the problem of tumor generation, because tumors are, after all, a wart is a benign tumor. And these tumors often, the, the epithelial, and the mesenchymal, the carcinomas, and the sarcomas simply keep out of the reach of the immune system for very long. And once they're big enough and decay, you have a problem. Because the damage or the problem is so huge that the immune response, even if it could be made, actually is too slow and too weak. So even in the times of immunotherapy in tumors, you still want to have a good friend, and that is an excellent surgeon. Now, if you go into the lymph node, then lymph nodes are very interesting and complex anatomical structures. I've tried just to stay in here for the B cells with the IgM receptor on the surface. And you see these lymph follicles, in the middle usually are T cells, and around are these B cells. Now, in these lymph nodes and in the spleen, you find interactions between cells 
that present the antigen that have gobbled up, phagocytosed this antigen. They can be dendritic cells or macrophages, other phagocytes, and present the antigen in association with MAC class 1. I don't have to go into the details of that. And they will induce cytotoxic CD8 T cells. Or the antigen is phagocytosed and re-expressed in association with MHC, major histocompatibility gene products of the class 2. And uh, these will initiate a response for CD4 T cells. Now, immunology and immunologists are a funny crowd. Because if you start saying, well, all the, the viral antigens that are synthesized in the cell go by the pathway of transplantation antigens type 1, and all the ones that are picked up, phagocytose, and then go through the phagolysosome into two, they represent two distinct classes of effective functions. Whenever such a general rule is defined, immunologists or some immunologists that ha are very good talker say, this cannot be true. Must be different. Because CD4 T cells also can kill. No reason why to think that. But if you push, of course, your in vitro assay, you will find some chromium release or some cell death. So, one general rule, and this particularly concerns the youngsters amongst you, whenever you want to publish a good paper in Nature, Science, or Journal of Ex Experimental Medicine, choose the test that will show you what you want to show. Now, let's go into antibody and B cell specificities. You see, you be, a mouse has about 10 to the 7, 5 times 10 to the 7 B cells, something like that. How many specificities can these B cells cover? Humans about 700 fold more. And there's a long debate whether it's 10 to the 12, because the combinatorial and, and, and reassortment type of, of genetics can easily generate 10 to the 12 different antibodies. Or the alternative is it's only about 10 to the 3. What is more likely? Well, this is theoretically possible, but maybe and probably is not necessary. Because if you look at the number of infectious agents that can kill you in five to seven days, they are not more than a thousand. Even that is a very high estimate. You know, probably it's more like 50, like 100. So, you know, that's, that's the key of the center of the immune response. So it's pro more likely, you know, on an operational basis, it's 10 to the 3. What about affinity or binding strength of these antibodies? Well, you know, it depends on how you measure it. If you use ELISA, and I'd say, you know, biochemists and 98% of immunologists use ELISA assays. You denature your protein, you stick it on plastic, you hope it hasn't been denatured too much, that your antibody still binds. But the affinity, the binding strength, is in the order of 10 to the minus 5. And just think, you always use phosphate buffer saline. Now tell me where in a human body you have phosphate buffer saline. Hmm? Maybe the vitreous you know, it's close. But the rest, I mean, this is all very artifactual. So, a serotypic antibody specificity. You all know if you have poliovirus number one, 
serotype 2, serotype 3. If you are immune against one, you're not immune against serotype 2 or 3. That's the definition of a ser serotype specificity. And that's the only specificity that counts for survival or avoidance of severe disease. And there, the affinity is in the order of 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 11. So, you know, this is huge, the difference. But, Rick, you know, just remember, most of the research is done at this level. So some of the things we find in literature must be wrong. There's no other way. Of course, accessibility of the antigen on an infected cell or wherever is of utmost importance. And then, of course, if an infectious agent sort of has the genetics to mutate the key determinants, then the infectious agent, the parasite, you know, sort of escapes the immune response permanently, all the time. I will talk about this. But first, let's again look at specificity of these antibodies. If, you know, you take a ra raptor virus like rabies virus, but influenza is the same, you know, all these acute cytopathic viruses have the same buildup. It's a multimeric exposure of a trima of the glycoprotein that is the target for neutralizing antibodies. And you can easily take your fingers and put them together because an antibody dimension is roughly the size of the finger in the context of these glycoproteins. And because of the packaging of these glycoproteins, it's not impossible to put an antibody in between these glycoproteins. So the only specificity of an intact virus or infectious cell is actually the tip of your fingers. So you can make a thousand different antibodies, 10,000. It's of no help. The only one is against the tip. I'll get back to that. Now, when you take the FAB of an antibody, that's one of the arms of an antibody, then you see the binding corresponds roughly to the size of a trimer. It's a bit smaller, but it's not bigger. It's not so that you can place two such FABs independently on one of your fingertips, because you can cross-compete with 50 monoclonals, monoclonal antibodies, you know, mutually, and you can't stick two onto a virus or an infected cell. So, when you compare that size of the footprint and the binding, and you compare that with the hapten, which actually is, you know, chemistry's contribution, because in the 20s, um, the limitation of immunology was, of course, that we didn't have purified antigens. So the chemist came along and said, yeah, I can solve that problem. You know, <laughs> I can give you a kilogram of purified albumin or bovine serum albumin because there's plenty of it, easy to do. So that's why immunology is about bovine serum albumin and albumin. But that doesn't kill you, you know. It's a nice tool to play around with. And then they said, well, you know, if we determine the, the, the end amino acid, we can use dinitrophenol or trinitrophenol, any phenyl group, to mark that, that end amino, that open amino uh, group. And therefore, they argued, chemists argued, and then immunologists argued, you know, I want to distinguish antibodies that can bind to ovalbumin and distinguish with from ovalbumin D and P. Of course, that's a no problem in infectious diseases. But that's why 90% of immunology is about such a so-called hapten, a nitrophenyl group, a phenyl group. This is six atoms, six C atoms, which is the equivalent of one amino acid. But the interaction between a FAB and the biologically relevant target, of course, is usually between 7 and 14 amino acids. And therefore, the affinity against such a determinant is in the order of 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 11. 
whereas the affinity for such a small one amino acid equivalent antigen, which biologically doesn't exist, is in the order of 10 to the minus 5. You can detect it in an ELISA assay. But of course, you are only interested in this and higher. And the frequency of the B cells, that is, the frequency of the so-called specific B cells for serotype, namely virus surface type of serotypically defined specificity, is in the order of 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 6. Whereas for DNP, it's 10 to the minus 2. Every hundred B cell recognizes a happen. So you immediately imagine the rules of the academics versus infectious disease immunology can't be the same, simply because the numbers are not the same. Of course, a purified molecule is handy, but if it cannot be defined as to its biological activity, we have a problem. We study things correctly, we measure correctly, but it's useless. So I've tried to sort of give a general picture. You see, if an antibody is against a certain virus and has a affinity of 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 11, then this antibody is good enough to neutralize that virus. But the same antibody, of course, can bind a phenyl group or something like this, but with much lower affinity at 10 to the minus 6. So an anti-VSV neutralizing antibody may well have a specificity in addition against DNP or dinitrophil. But qualitatively, you know, it's something completely different. And the only thing that is biologically relevant is up here. Down here, this is only for a PhD thesis or uh, a university lab. So, on the virus or our intact bacterium, you have these multimeric structures. These multimeric structures are very efficient in inducing an immune response. Sometimes they are not multimeric, they are distant. They may or may not have a glycocalyx that sort of hides most of these antigens and just leaves the tips, many examples for that. Or there are these determines, they can be in multimeric or monomeric situations that sort of vary the tip of the finger or glycoprotein, and of course an antibody that binds to this surface will not be efficiently binding to this mutated determinant. And that's exactly what happens in HIV all the time. It happens in influenza. It happens in malaria, plasmodium, parasites, everywhere. But the serotypically defined classical acute cytopathic childhood infections they all belong to this stable type of non-mutating viruses, and that's, of course, the reason why we have good vaccines against them. Because if, if the agent varies all the time, you cannot make a vaccine. Very simple. That's why we don't have a generalized, a general vaccine against influenza. We don't have a general vaccine against HIV. We don't have one against malaria, although some people claim they have. It's always, you know, just at the border of significance. So it doesn't hurt you, but it certainly is not a general uh, vaccine. And then you need a certain size of the antigen against a DNP, a natural group. You can't make antibodies. Against nicotine, it's very difficult to make antibodies. It's too small. Oxytocin, you don't have autoantibodies. Against insulin, you have no functional, biologically functional antibody, but against the big ones, you do. So size matters. Numbers matter and size matters. So let's, true, let's just simply check, is that real what I say?
if you take a virus or a virus infected cell, and we again take a rabies virus like in mice, it's called vesicular stomatitis virus. There are two serotypes we usually use. One is called New Jersey, the other Indiana. So you take any serum from an immune cow, human, monkey, rat, mouse, and you stain the virus or the infected cell with that serum, you get good fluorescence. And now the question, can you compete away that fluorescence by any monoclonal neutralizing antibody? And just to be on the safe side, you make 30 or 60 of them. And Hans-Peter Rost, a PhD student in the lab, did that. And in fact, with all of them, you can compete away all the staining back to backline. Which is surprising. Just imagine, you take a serum from an, Im an immune cow or rat or mouse or human that has thousands of specificities, antibodies, against thousands of fragments and antigens in these rab rabies viruses. But still, it's only one, the neutralizing one, that can do that. Because if you try to do the same with a non-neutralizing monoclonal antibody, nothing happens. So that really means there's only one protective antigenic site on, on these acute killer viruses. The, and there's never enough space to put two together. So the sites are very small. Important, there is no affinity maturation. In all immunological textbooks, you read about affinity maturation. It occurs, of course, because of the hypermutability of, of the antibody machinery. But, you know, affinity maturation, that is the maturation duration of the affinity to higher degrees takes, let's say, three weeks. But for these acute cytopathic infections that kill you in five days, of course, by that time you're dead. So it's useless. So the affinity must be there to start out with. It must be in the repertoire. Otherwise, it's too slow. So let's look at that. If you take just normal serum of humans or even better of mice that you have kept under very sterile or hygienically clean conditions, you take that serum and put it together with this rabies virus, you find it has a neutralizing activity of 1 in 20. Isn't that surprising? Now, what serologists or microbiology labs do is when a serum from a patient comes in, the first thing they do is to dilute it one in 30. Why? Because they want, don't want to see that. See, they simply dilute the serum and then their value is zero. But it isn't zero. zero. Because if you take that normal serum with a 1 in 20 titer against VSV, let's say, Indiana. And you then test against Indiana, the neutralization is gone of the normal serum. But if you now test it on the other serotype, on VSV New Jersey, it's still 1 in 20. So it's specific. It's serotype specific. This reflects the fact that the repertoire contains these specificities. And the surprising, in a way, is you start out with a titer of 1 in 20 to 1 in 30. And to be protected, you need a titer of 1 in 800 to 1 in 900. So that's only an increase of 30-fold, which is not that great, in fact. But to trigger that response takes about three to four days. So it's not, you know, in one day. It takes time. And this is because the B cells have to multiply. They have to, mat be, to mature to become antibody-producing cells, plasma cells. And the whole process takes these three to five days. Now, 
you can do a biological experiment and take mice that are called UNT mice. They cannot make antibodies. So it's like an A gamma globulinemic kid cannot make antibodies. And now you infect these mice with a rabies virus, and all the mice die in seven days. And now you simply inject into these mice, let's say, half a milliliter or two milliliters of normal mouse serum. You hadn't immunized the donors. And what you see is this lethal effect of the infection immediately disappears because of that natural titan. Very important. So, let me summarize just at this point. We have infections with lethal cytopathic viruses, such as this rabies virus. And there you find the infection. You find a T cell response. And you find ELISA antibodies. And you find neutralizing antibodies. And they all come up extremely quick. In four days, the whole thing comes up. And then you have a second group of infections, the non-cytopathic ones that don't kill you in seven days, but take, let's say, in mice one and a half years, in humans 60 years, these chronic persisting types of non-cytopathic virus. There you have the virus, you have the T cell response, prompt. You have ELISA antibodies, very prompt. Same is true for HIV. You know, you have a T cell response, you have an ELISA response, he hepatitis B, a T cell response, an ELISA response. But the neutralizing antibody response takes 100 to 300 days. This simply tells you the, all this immunology is not important for these viruses. In fact, as I've told you initially, you know, they cause the damage. And these antibodies eventually will, by affinity maturation in this case, will come up. But they come up, you know, once the virus is established a long time. And why can the virus establish the infection? Because by the time these neutralizing antibodies come up that were okay against the initial virus infection, the virus has mutated and these neutralizing antibodies are for not functioning because of mutation risk. And that's, of course, one reason why we don't have an HIV vaccine, simply because we cannot imitate that co-evolution of the virus. So let's do a very simple experiment. And this was a PhD student um, in the lab. Infect or vaccinate mice, in this case again with that rabies-like virus, with two serotypes. You get immune T cells and immune B cells. After three months, you take these so-called memory immune cells out. You transfer them to a naive recipient. You challenge that recipient everybody dies. <laughs> Surprise, isn't it? Because the textbook would have said, well, you transfer memory cells, and these memory cells are responsible for pr protection, but it doesn't work, you see. If you repeat that experiment, of course, with sheep red blood cells or ovalbumin DNP, the experiment always works. That is, you get a quicker and higher response. But it still takes eight days for these responses to come, come up. And for an infection, of course, you're dead by that time. So, you know, you can measure things the way you want to do it. That is the way you hope to publish in a good journal. But you often lose to and forget to ask the question, do I not only measure correctly, but do I measure something that is important? And disease, of course, is important, you know. If legs are up, it's bad. 
If legs stay down, it's good. It's very simple. Okay, now where does that tell? If you take instead of the cells, the immune cells, you take simply the serum of that donor mouse, transpose it, everybody survives. And this experiment, of course, is the experiment we all have survived at birth because we received immune antibodies from the mother through the placenta, and these antibodies are responsible for protection during the maturation phase of the immune system, basically 12 months, let's say, after birth. So there is a very important physiological equivalent to what we want to learn, and it's crucial because if these maternal antibodies don't find the way, the offspring are simply dead by any first infection. Now, again, it's, it's a matter of how you measure things. Because if you measure neutralizing antibodies after vaccination, and you look at neutralizing protective antibodies, within 30 to 50 days, they are below protection level. If you measure the same with ELISA, it goes for 300, 350 days. But as I've just said, don't measure this. Measure this. So it's only the serotype-specific neutralizing antibody titer that predicts protection against acute lethal infections, period. Irrelevant what the ELISA shows, that's the only thing that counts. And it counts particularly during the 12 first months of life. Now, in the past several years, many people have published in Nature and Science, good examples, and have said, well, that's, you know, this must not be true because I have thought of some cross-protective antibodies that are one monoclonal or two monoclonal, protect against all serotypes, or at least half the serotypes in influenza or HIV or whatever it may be. And they, you know, they're not all that stupid, but they <laughs> use antibodies against these common determinants. But the serotypic definition of the determinants is up here. So yes, you can make antibodies against common determinants. And if your assay is lousy enough, you even have a result that these antibodies can shift the result. But if you go back in vivo, and that of course is difficult in humans, you will find that it doesn't work. Because otherwise you, could, you wouldn't be able to imagine why serotypic definition exists. And this is true for HIV, it has been shown for influenza. And therefore, I just show you, you know, for influenza, it's very interesting. You know relatively many details of the infections. But these are these evolutionary trees of such um, influenza virus in, in humans. And if you, this was done in 2008. So if you had immune antibodies against that isolate, these neutralizing antibodies were capable of neutralizing the previous few strains. But the antibodies that were generated the year before, two years before, were not able to neutralize the newest of the selected strains. So there is a one-directional type of evolution, mutational evolution of the virus, which we cannot predict. But influenza is easy because we probably have 500 or 600 isolates. The mutational variation can only comprise about that size. For HIV, it's probably 100,000. So how to make a vaccine that covers all these variants? Well, practically, it's impossible. So theoretically, you could think of an HIV vaccine or an influenza vaccine, but it's a combination of all possible hemagglutinins. I'm pessimistic and take 10 to the 3 variants. And here the same. You know, you have a combination of all variants. Maybe it's 10 to the 4, maybe it's 10 to the 7. We don't know. So it's theoretically not impossible, but practical not, practically not feasible. 
I've said that many times. I think uh, PhD students should uh, keep that in mind. Now, just a brief addition to T cell specificity. I've emphasized the antibodies because antibodies sort of have grown unpopular, you know, for many reasons. For technical reasons, they're very popular. But for protection reasons, they sort of, you know, T cells are much favored. Maybe I must be claimed for part of it. But anyway, T cell specificity can be defined functionally as the T B cooperation, the interaction of T cells and B cells to make IgG responses. That would be a functional assay. Or to make cytotoxic T cells against non-cytopathic viruses. That would be another one, or against a tumor. But most, 99% of T cell specificity is measured with tetramers that bind to the T cell receptor, or gamma interferon release, or the killing of LPS blasts. These are sort of very fragile pumped up target cells that if you stare at them, they release and chromium and die off. So, you know, you choose these tools to document what you want to document. But at the end of the day, the only thing that counts is this. TB cooperation to make IgG and to have cytotoxic T cells against non-cytopathic viruses or tumors. And I just want to illustrate that with one simple infection example. In our lab, we worked a lot with a virus that behaves like hepatitis B or hepatitis C in human. It's a non-cytopathic virus. And if you stick it into the foot pad, make an infection, the foot pad swells because there is a T cell reactivity against that local virus infection. And the dynamics of that foot, foot swelling is, you know, until day six, almost nothing happens. But then there's a swelling. The first peak is by a CD8 T cells. There's a second shoulder by helper T cells, CD4. And then it disappears. And by that time, the virus is gone. Now, we had Hans-Peter Pierce here in the lab with Hans Hengarten made a transgenic mouse. And that mouse expresses a particular T cell specificity of a cytotoxic T cell against that virus, against the glycoprotein part of that virus. So we thought, you know, if the T8 cells give us that first peak in a mouse that has much higher frequency of these specific T cells, actually, the swelling should be much earlier. So we did the experiment. And what we found, in fact, after three days, the swelling started. But then, surprise, the swelling went down immediately. At six days, the swelling was gone. But by seven, seven days, the swelling was up again. And you know, swelling, I mean, this is 50% of the foot pad. I mean, you know, you, you don't have to buy a micron manipulator. To, to see that. It's a big fish pad. So what has happened? Well, we isolated the virus from this foot and this early phase and found that after six days, a virus had developed that had a mutation. Just one of the amino acids of that nine peptide had changed. And that made that the cytotoxic T cells could not recognize that peptide any longer. A first example of a TCD8 escape mutant virus. And you, by now you know that this happens all the time in HIV, the same. So these viruses at high numbers, they can mutate all the time and escape a protective immune response but the condition, of course, they have to be non-cytopathic. Otherwise, they would kill the host very easy. 
So my summary is, <laughs> do not believe in dogmas. Huh? I think that's particularly for students. Don't believe anything that the old guy says or the textbook says, because many things are simply wrong, also in the textbooks. And you know the saying, we don't know which half of the textbook is wrong. So we have to find out. Just critically ask questions, examine, test, do experiments. <laughs> Measuring correctly the wrong parameter is bad. Hmm? <laughs> ideas are cheap. I've had many, many good ideas. But if you don't do something about them, it's useless. And I think, you know, as an MD, you have the huge advantage of being in relation with disease. You have the huge advantage to see the effect of your ideas and experiments. Because if you modify or alter the disease course or avi avoid to the legs coming up, then you know you have done something right. Because otherwise, the disease phenotype wouldn't change. And this is a very, very good quality control. Uh, well, av avoid misleading promises. You know, 83, 1983, 84, you know, there was a promise another two, three years, an HIV vaccine will be ready, ba, ba, ba. Now we are 1960. Of course, the vaccine isn't there. <laughs> Cannot be there. So why make the promise? I think very important. Evolution cannot be beaten. We can think of whatever you want. If you use the same tools, like neutralizing antibodies, like activated T cells, and we want to beat, to be better than evolution, we always fail. However, we can do better by using new tools, you know, and of course, antivirals, antibiotics, education, these are tools that evolution has never used. So there we can beat, but not simply claiming we make a vaccine against HIV, which we can't. Just remember, we know relatively little. That's just how it is. Well, I don't argue whether it's 2% or 5%. Maybe on a sunny day, it's 10% but probably not more. So there's plenty to be done. But I think wrong doubts and misleading hopes are even more dangerous, dangerous than not knowing. And I think that's very important. Because wrong hopes, also in medicine, is a disaster. And then when you do experiments, don't sleep, don't miss surprises. Thank you. Now, of course, if you find something that isn't right, one should correct. But science is ex remarkably, remarkably resistance, resistant against corrections. You cannot, even important experiments that are negated, you cannot publish these papers in good journals. But we have a good precedence. And this is Spain, you see. In former times, on this bandera here, it says non plus ultra. This is a sort of, that's the origin of non plus ultra. That's the top. And this was saying that beyond the columns of Hercules, you know, in Gibraltar, um, there was nothing beyond until, of course, Cristoforo Colombo um, sailed to the west to find a new way to Indies. And then after two years, he came back and said, well, you know, there's something there. So the Spanish king, kings were very good, and I think we should be as good as them. They simply crossed the non, and since then it says plus ultra. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's... You know, that's a, a, a very clean, efficient solution. And just to remind you all the experiments and 
I was thinking I have um, summarized here is due to many of these people here assembled at one of their lab reunions. It's on the roof of the ATH in Zurich, Hans Hengartner. Uh, his, uh, our Mexican <laughs> host who played a major role here in, in the lab life. There are many here you may or may not recognize, but of course most are immunologists. And we always had a combination of medicos and basic scientists, about one in two or one in three, and I think that was an absolutely um, ideal combination because I think you need pathophysiology and disease together with good and expert technical expertise and intuition. And Constantino, of course, could profit from that. Thanks very much for your attention. ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta? No sean tímidos. ¿Preguntas? By the way, I have a question. Nothing is clear. But I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. So, how the cancer cells are avoiding the immune systems? Or why? Oh, the why is easy. Uh, why is this? Yeah, because you see, we only have to live up to age 20 or 22. There's no solid peripheral tumor that hits you before 35. So the tumor problem is a non-problem. I mean, of course, individually it's a problem. But in terms of evolution, it's a, it's a non-existing problem. And that's, of course, why it's so difficult. Because immunology and immunity basically has nothing to do with tumors, particularly with solid peripheral tumors. I'm sad to say. Just wondering, doctor, about uh, the beginning of your work in Australia, being a, a physician, how do you uh, start working with the, this uh, world of microbiology? How, how do you, coming from a different um, area of medicine, get interest in this sort of world? That's an easy one, you see, because when you are a medical doctor, you know, there are two ways to be an MD. Either you believe in your textbooks and you say, if I have a sore throat, I take penicillin. You know, easy. Hmm? And you get a fee for that, that's okay. But, you know, maybe some physicians say, but, you know, why is it so that a, a strep throat causes additional disease manifestations? So you start asking questions, why, why, why? And I think that's, that's all that is needed. Simply ask, you know, why does this disease develop? Why is there AIDS with HIV infection? You know, there were all sorts of ideas that actually homosexuals were immunosuppressed and that's propagated the HIV. I mean, all sorts of crazy stuff. And only careful analysis molecular definition of what happens is going to solve the problem. And sometimes you even find a therapeutic approach to the disease. Vaccines is an excellent example. Right? Hi. Um, about Zika virus, I was thinking if it falls in any of these categories, like uh, can we develop a vaccine or, is it, or does it fall in the 
we can't have a vaccine. Well, of course, with Zika virus, we simply don't know enough epidemiologically and otherwise, you know. Now the first reports come that certain brain cells may get infected and slowed down in differentiation. This may or may not be true. We'll find out in 20 years, I can tell you. But the other, I mean, the easy example is Ebola. You know, Ebola is very efficient in killing us. But it's also very easy to make a vaccine. Because Ebola belongs to that category of the rabies-like virus. Otherwise, we wouldn't sit here. You know? And with Zika, we just, I think it's too early to say. Hello. Um, you said, uh, well, you explained how drastically the life expectancy of people has grown in the last few years. Um, given that now we live more years, does that give diseases or viruses um, more time to like to cause uh, greater damage on, on humans? Can we expect um, viruses and diseases to change, to, to become more aggressive or more chronic for, for people? Not really, you know, because there is no such thing as a new virus. I mean, all viruses that are important epidemiologically have come from somewhere. So that a virus, you know, drops from the sky and destroys us is chances zero. You know. So now, you know, the problem is, like with tumors, you see, if you die at five years of age, then you're dead. You have no chance of developing a tumor. And the same is true for many chronic viral infections. You see, hepatitis B, until you have a clinic manifestation that is serious, takes anywhere from between, on average, 10 years to 40 years. But by that time, you know, you have had your kids and selection is, is out of the way. So chronic inflammation and chronic immune responses and any chronic disease, of course, hangs together with these chronic infections or chronic immunopathologies. Now again, you see, autoimmunities or chronic immunopathologies like arthritis or, or chronic aggressive hepatitis, these are all diseases that are important after 25. So in terms of evolution, you know, it's, it's not important. And that's why these problems preoccupy medicine, of course, because we get so old that these diseases actually, you know, bother us. And we learn a lot from these diseases. And we can do many things now. You know, just reducing inflammation in very general terms by simply taking every day in aspirin. You know, this of course is for prevention for cardiac infarction. But in fact, you have an anti-inflammatory response. And then you, they make these mega analytical uh, analysis of, of, of such patients and they find they have fewer tumors. Simply by reducing chronic inflammation. So, you know, it's all worthwhile doing. Uh, professor, is, is there any molecular mechanism um, that makes virus a very mutable virus and therefore no vaccine can be developed against it, against the others that um, vaccines can be developed and probably they don't have this metagenic probability. No. Is there any mechanism that those no. viruses bring? No, I mean not in detail. But if you are a poliovirus, you know, you simply cannot mutate because um, of other constraints, like the glycoprotein doesn't 
permit maturation of the vile part, and, and you know, many, many constraints. It's rather a surprise that such mutability exists. And these viruses are all non cytopathic So you need much more time. And that has something to do with the infectious cycle and, you know, many other aspects. I, I don't think it's one mechanism. Thank you. As you just said, Dr. Rolf, um, chronic inflammation is, is uh, very worrisome for, for us. But in Mexico, as in other, many other uh, countries around the world, globalization is trending to high calorie intake meals that uh, triggers more inflammation and uh, uh, occurs in this kind of psychoneuroendocrine immunity uh, regulation or uh, overexpression of, of diseases? Yes, I think that's a very easy question. Because you see, when I grew up, my mother told me what to eat and how much to eat. And there was no discussion. <laughs> very simple. And I think, you know, that's goes in the, to the chapter of, of education, of uh, understanding, of being reasonable and all these aspects. And we all know this is the most difficult thing to achieve. You know, molecular bi biology or virology, this is easy. But you tell your kids <laughs> what to do. It's not so easy. And the, the problem is a bit like with chronic, chronic infectious diseases. You see, you do something on day, let's make think of one year. And you don't know what that action has as a consequence. Because you see your result of your kids only 20 years later. And then you can't correct. And I think these, these problems like tumor, chronic inf uh, inflammation and so on, are of that type. And I think smoking is a very easy example. You see, smoking is not a catastrophe because of the nicotine. It's a catastrophe because you voluntarily create chronic inflammations every hour, all the time, for 50 years. Which is absolutely crazy, you know? <laughs> it's completely crazy. And you would think, you know, people should be educated. But that's, it's, it's impossible. Alcohol, same problem, you know? Then some people say, well, you know, it's easy for you to say. You have no worries, you know? It's not true, not true. <laughs> but, but, you know, if you move sufficiently, if you eat reasonably, if you don't smoke, if you don't drink too much, <laughs> if you vaccinate your kids, I mean, this solves 80% of the long-term problem, uh, medical problems. It's very easy, you know. I haven't answered your, your question, I know, but... <laughs> And, and doctor, about uh, these rare um, diseases like lupus or sclerosis multiple or all of these uh, diseases, w what is expected for these uh, people who is with this situation? Um, well, situation? thank you for this question because, you see, there is, particularly in immunology, we have dogmas. So one dogma, very important dogma, is that the immune system does not react against our own antigens. Now, this is basically true. But whenever you have chronic inflammation, you create a peculiar environment. Let's take uh, Sjogren's or thyroiditis. Thyroiditis, Hashimoto, or rheumatoid arthritis, where 
the action is always in an organ. So you can ask, you know, why is it only in that organ and not other organs? Well, the answer is probably, in most cases, I can't, in biology, never can say all or 100%. But in most cases, there are chronic infections associated with these organs. And these trigger responses that otherwise would not be triggered. So it's, you know, it's not really autoimmunity. It's a, immuno, a, a damaging immune response, I've, as I've mentioned, for hepatitis or HIV, that triggers such responses. And usually, you know, when the organ is all gone, like the islet cells, of lung homes in, in the pancreas, then of course the response dies because there's no antigen left. So, you know, I think in my admittedly biased point of view, there are three categories of diseases. Infectious diseases where we know the infectious agent and we know we have to have immunoprotection. These are the cytopathic infections. Then we have infections with non-cytopathic agents. If you know the virus, then we call, call the disease immunopathology. If you do not know the virus or the bacterium, then we call it autoimmunity. I mean, it's slightly overstated. But, you know, if we would learn about the etiologies, the origin, causes of, of these chronic diseases, we would learn a lot because we could interfere. Una última pregunta. Good afternoon. I've always wondered if immune specificity is um, dependent up upon androgen presenting cells. I mean, well, Dendritic cells usually kind of like choose the antigens they will present to T cells and stuff. Wouldn't environment and the antigens that are being kept upon the lymph and stuff uh, determine which T cells will be selected and prevail? Yes. You see, that's why I mentioned papillomavirus. Actually, papillomavirus avoids lung home cells and dendritic cells because the virus grows outside of these cells. So nothing happens. But all viruses against which you need a prompt immune response infect macrophages, dendritic cells, all these cells, and cells within the lymph node and the spleen. Because otherwise you are dead. Good afternoon. Um, you know, viruses seem to came out of nowhere, as you said. Well, I mean. They the don't fall from the sky. <laughs> <laughs> I meant that. Um, but do you think that maybe in the future we will be able enough, I mean, our immunity system to work efficiently enough to do not become sick? No, no, I mean, you know, I mean, the clinical experience tells you that viruses or infections in general terms that kill you quickly, they, the defense must be efficient. If they don't do kill you, if it, they don't kill you quickly and only kill you after 20 years, it doesn't matter. I mean, but if you think we'll be, we can have Yes, I understand your question. And we have done so. You see, the anti-HIV chemotherapy, antivirals, is a fantastic success of molecular virology. I mean, this is, is extraordinary. You know, 40 years ago, there was a one antiviral. Now we have a whole gamut 
very efficient. Anybody you would have asked in 1970 whether this is possible, everybody would have said no. So, you know, science works. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, Professor, thanks very much about your very, very interesting talk. Let's uh, give a little present to Professor Sinke Gnabel. This is the medal of the 100th anniversary of the School of yeah. Chemistry. It's a little diploma. Yeah. And this is a little pin like this. Mm -hmm. Also, the topic of the School of Chemistry yes. is their uh, own. Yeah. And, uh, and now congratulations for your talk. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much.